Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, precious of God. Lord of his mind. Turn if you will this morning to Daniel, the third chapter. Again, that is Daniel chapter 3. I'm sure just calling that particular chapter to you, our minds immediately uh, think about what happened many <coughs> years ago uh, when they were in the fiery furnace. And certainly this morning we want to talk about that just a little bit. We also want to draw out some uh, more application, more lessons from that particular text uh, to help us all be better Christians today. We want to begin in verse 24 and verse 25. Those are going to be our two main verses for this particular lesson. Though, again, we are going to look at pretty much uh, most of the entire chapter to kind of give us some context uh, for what it is we want to talk about. In Daniel chapter 3, beginning here with verse number 24, the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. They have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the sun of God. I want to look for a subject this morning, forged in the fire. Again, that is forged in the fire. One of my favorite shows uh, that comes on the History Channel is actually entitled uh, Forged in the Fire. Uh, each time I watch the show, I'm always amazed at uh, how hot the fire has to be uh, for some of the strongest blades to be formed, forged. The bladesmith here have to work under extreme pressures of fighting against the clock while having the fire uh, pretty much right in their face. Uh, some blades cut and some don't. And at the end of the competition is only one bladesmith standing. If you key in this morning on verse number one of Daniel chapter three, the Bible there says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. If you remember in Daniel chapter one, there you have uh, Daniel and King Nebuchadnezzar more or less having a conversation with each other. And there, uh, Daniel said in verse number one, Daniel one verse four, the Bible there talks about children and, uh, who have no blemish. And later on in that chapter there, the Bible talks about how uh, there more or less was a competition. Daniel said, we're not going to defile ourselves with the portion of the king's meat. And if you remember there, towards the end of that chapter, Daniel and his friends uh, were fairer than those who had uh, served Nebuchadnezzar. In Daniel chapter 2, Daniel and his friends are now being elevated. And so that more or less gives us some context as to what the Bible actually lays before us in chapter 3. Because when they are elevated by the king, the king's servants see this. And they uh, really don't like this too much because they believe in their minds that uh, they are the ones who should be elevated. But Daniel, of course, with the help of his God, he was able to be elevated. And I want to say that with elevation, it always comes a new test in life. Here you have these men in chapter 1, they overcome one test. And here you have in chapter 2, another test is before them. Immediately at the end of chapter 2, once you get to chapter 3, another test comes to them again. It's almost as if we work hard in life to get over one test just so we can get to the next test, just so we can get to the one after that. And it's almost as if the test never stops. It's almost as if God constantly wants us to prove ourselves to him. And I'll say to that this morning, absolutely. 
Because when you look at the Bible, especially uh, one that comes to my mind, that being Abraham, Abraham did everything God requested of him. Every, Abraham always gave to his friend, as the prophet Isaiah says, he's always giving to his friend God. But God is constantly always asking something from him. And you would think, surely God will give us a break. Surely God will, you know, give us a couple weeks off. But it doesn't work that way. Immediately after these men are elevated, immediately after these men do something with the help and with the power of God, here comes another test for these men. Again, Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to build a golden image. And King Nebuchadnezzar more or less gives some really simple instructions. The Bible here says in verse number 3, the princes and the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, drop down to verse number four. Then a herald cried aloud to you, it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, sapphire, the psaltery, the dusselmer, and all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. King Nebuchadnezzar here pretty much gave some simple instructions. When you hear the music, you bow down to my God. When you hear the trumpets, you bow down to my God. Now, if I was one of those captives in Babylon, and again in verse number four, I hear this herald, I hear this man coming, and he's saying what King Nebuchadnezzar has told him to say. To me, if I'm seeing that information, it seems like pretty simple instruction. I have to do what the king has requested of me because if I don't, there will be consequences. Look at verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Again, elevation always comes with a new task. But in verse number 7, the Bible says, Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound, verse number 8 says, Wherefore, at the time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. I find it amazing that what people can't control, they always look for ways to destroy. Very often in life, there are certain people who, you know, they have to go all the way down just to find something bad about you so they can tell everyone else so those people can talk bad about you as well. Here you have these men just simply doing what God had requested of them. They had already made up in their minds what they were going to do. They had already made a conscious decision that when we hear the music, we're not going to bow down. In preparation for the material, one uh, commentary, and that's why you have to be really careful at reading commentaries. One particular individual said the reason these men did not bow down is because they had arthritis in their knees. Now, when you consider the fact that these are younger men, and you consider the fact that these are able and healthy men, it just goes to show you sometimes how people will do anything to discredit the word of God. People will say anything in their mind to discredit the fact that people actually want to stand up for the God of heaven. What they can't control, they will destroy. And so the Bible says again in verse number 8, these Chaldeans, these Babylonians, they accused the Jews. But look at verse 11. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast in the midst of the fiery furnace. And so what you have here from verse 11 down to verse number 14, King Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a meeting with these men. And King Nebuchadnezzar is asking these men, I heard you didn't bow down to my God. I heard you didn't bow down to my image. But I'm going to give you one more chance. How gracious is the king to do that? Because most kings, if a person disrespected their God, but if a person also disrespected them, that person would immediately be done with. But King Nebuchadnezzar said, because I did elevate you, and because I know you all are good and moral, upright men, I'm going to give you one more chance to prove yourself to me. 
when you hear the music, I want you to bow down to my God. I want you to serve my God. But if they bow down to his image, they cannot stand for God. If they bow their knees to this man in his arrogance, in his God, then there is no room left for these men to stand up for the God in heaven. It kind of reminds me of what you find in Exodus 32 there when Moses comes back down from the mountain. He has that meeting with God. Exodus 32, 1 down to verse number 8, verse number 9 especially, he picks up Joshua who was halfway up the mountain. And as they make their way down the mountain, Joshua said, what's all that noise? There's a great cry of war that's coming from the camp. Now, if I'm Moses and, 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 and if I'm Joshua on that particular test, I know for a fact it cannot be a, a, a cry of war because we just left Egypt. We just came across the Red Sea. Here we are at the foot of Mount Sinai. Why would God lead us out here again just to fight one more time? And so they get down there and they find God's people worshiping a golden image. And Moses is questioning Aaron as to why did you allow this to happen? And Aaron said, well, you know what, Moses? You know the people are set on mischief. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. And as a result of that, the Bible there says his anger had waxed hot. And the point there is, you have all these people bowing down to something that cannot save them, that cannot lift their burden. The Bible talks about in Isaiah chapter 49 and verse number 9 and 10, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, saying my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Why do we study the Old Testament so we can remember? So we can understand how God dealt with men back then because the way God deals with us today is really not all that different. Most, most, most importantly, when you look at the Old Testament, it's almost like looking in a mirror. Because we see how foolish some of the decisions the Israelites made, but yet if we look at our own lives, we make the same foolish decisions and mistakes they make as well. King Nebuchadnezzar said, when you hear the music, I just want you to bow down. Of course, we know in verse number 16, that great text uh, pretty much in this particular chapter 16 and 17 they said king we are careful not to answer thee in this matter if it be so our God whom we serve he is an able God he is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand look at what the Bible says in verse 18 but if not be it known unto thee O king these men are not even sure whether or not the God they serve can actually deliver them. Now, I don't know how much doubt these men actually had in their mind, but I know these men are not 100% sure, and that's okay sometimes. These men said, but if not, he may deliver us, he may not deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we still won't bow down to your God. We still won't bow down to your image. They had a commitment to their convictions. The time to be committed to God is not when you get into the fire. You'll be burned up. It'll be too late. These men already made up in their minds long time ago that even if this was going to lead them to their death, they were okay with that. Because we ought to obey God rather than man. These men had a commitment to their convictions that even though the king did elevate them, and if you look at it from the king's perspective, I elevated these men, the least they can do is bow down and serve my God. The least they can do is bow down and worship the image which I have set up. But these men were not going to bow down. I find it amazing when you look at the entire Bible, whom God loves, he disciplines. It's not always about punishment. It's about development. It's not always that you did something wrong, but God is trying to forge you. God is trying to structure you 
to, so you can develop into a certain character. Because nine times out of ten, the person we need to be for the cause of Christ, we won't become those people by ourselves. Because in our minds, we believe that we're already doing good enough. We've already believed that we've checked all the boxes, doing everything God wants us to do. So God has to build character. The further you go, we eventually become or should take on the character of God. God sometimes will place you in the hottest fires to burn away what doesn't need to be there. Again, when I watch the show and I watch how these men continue to uh, put the sword into the fire and, and, and the fire burns away all the impurities, it gets rid of all the things that don't need to be there. It takes away this thing and it takes away that thing. And when the blade comes out and it's exactly how they want it to be, it's able to cut. And I can almost imagine God continuing to put us in the fire. And he's burning away all the things that don't need to be there. So we can ultimately be the people he wants us to be. If you remember in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, the Bible there talks about seeing we have been passed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight in sin which does so easily beset us. There are some things that we do. There are some people in our lives that are actually really not all that bad. And it really doesn't always lead to something being sinful. But the point there is, there are certain things that have to be cut off in order for us to be acceptable to the God in heaven. God will place you in the hottest fire to burn away what doesn't need to be there. But like these men, I want to ask you a question. What are you doing while you're in the fire? Many of us, unfortunately, don't think God is good until he gives us what we want. But God has to humble us. We have to get out of what many have labeled as this self-dependency. God wants, you to, God wants you to be dependent on his words, not your own. God will allow you to go through things you cannot fix. So we can destroy this notion in our mind that we are all self-sufficient. There are some things that no human solution can fix. So I have to do something else. I'm forced to do something else. We have to be okay with this idea of inconvenient obedience. I want you to obey me, God says, while you're in the fire. Now, the thing that's of interest this morning is, later on in verse 25, again, there was a fourth man walking with them. Can you be okay with God while you're being stoned spiritually. If you remember in Acts 4 and Acts chapter 5, here you have in Acts chapter 2, again, when the elevation comes persecution, here you have in Acts chapter 2, the Lord's church has now been established. You get over to Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5, and you immediately read about this persecution of the Lord's church. In Acts chapter 4, the Sanhedrin council said, we don't want you all to speak nor teach in the name of Jesus. We'll put you in the prison if you do. The same Peter that denied the Lord three times. The same Peter that said, I have no idea who the man is. That Peter said, we ought to obey God rather than man. That Peter said, I can't help but speak the things which I have seen and heard. That Peter said, you're more or less going to have to kill me in order for me to stop talking about Jesus. That Peter, that man was able to obey God while he was being stoned. And you shout while you're in prison. And by shout, I mean praise God while you're in prison. If you remember in Acts 16 and verse 25, the Bible says, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. I heard an illustration a couple days ago, and I thought it was so good. The individual said, you have good news and you have bad news. And he says, the bad news is, it's midnight. 
But the good news is, it's midnight. And the point there is, here you have a new day, a new opportunity, a new task or a new test you have to overcome so you can be pleasing to the God of heaven. The Bible says at midnight, the men are praying and singing praises unto God while they are in chains. While they are in shackles, they're praising the God in heaven. Man, that is a difficult thing to do. To praise God when I have all this fire in front of me. To praise God when it seems as if God just wants to stick me deeper and deeper into the fire. The kind of obedience that's inconvenient. I come to realize that many don't like this kind of preaching. Because we always want to come up with what God is doing for us. I'm going through this because God is about to elevate me to the next level. You're trying to pull me down, but God is going to raise me back up. I may have got fired off this job, but I'm, but I'm about to be the boss at the next job. We like that kind of preaching. But I want to let you know this morning, church, that God is not in any way loyal to your personal investment. Our world today has come up with this idea that I'm going through this so God can raise me to the next level. You show me book, chapter, and verse for that. God is concerned with your character. And if he does elevate us, it has nothing to do with my own personal agenda. Sometimes he's leading us to something, not just out of it. We always pray, God, get me out. But what if God is actually leading you in? Does that in any way devalue who God is? What if I told you this morning that God is not, that God is interested in taking you to places you don't want to go? Because it's in those places that builds character so we can be the people of God that he wants us to be. Yes. This doesn't in any way fit, fit the world's view of Christianity. That God is somehow loyal to my agenda. But God will take you to places so you can purposely see how inadequate you actually are. What if God wants you to see more of him and less than yourself? God doesn't want you to solve it. He wants you to trust him through it. It's not about your capacity or your strength. Again, in our society today, we get so many cool points if we are strong. If we're trying to be strong, if people know how strong we actually are, but everything isn't meant for you to solve. God wants to measure your obedience or dependence on him. God is not interested in my strength. God is not interested in how strong or how capable I am at handling a problem. Even when I'm strong, God is really not all that impressed. He is more impressed when I make him my strength. So he's really impressed with my dependency, not this idea of being self-sufficient. In fact, I make God angry and upset to the degree of my arrogance when I think I'm ever self-sufficient because I am not. So when you find yourself in the fiery furnace, you need to take comfort in the fact that you are doing what he said. There is no greater confidence than knowing I am doing what is right by my God. Because if I do what's right, look at verse 25. He answered and said, Lo, this is the enemy. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. But if you look at on verse 24 again, King Nebuchadnezzar really wants to make sure he's seeing what his natural eye is seeing. King Nebuchadnezzar asked his counselors, didn't we throw three men in there, but I see four. And then he says in verse 25, and the form of the fourth is like the son of God. Why didn't he show up before the furnace? I mean, really, he's God. He can be everywhere at every time. Why didn't he show up before the fire got hot? That would have been a little bit more convenient. 
God will never lead you to a place he can't get you out of. These men, from the fiery furnace, about to die, but they walk out as if they never even walked in. And it is because they have someone with them. You see, though we are being forced by God himself, and though our lives are uh, co constantly being surrounded by fire, we can get over that stuff with the help of God. But we cannot do it by ourselves. And as I often say, I probably say it too much, but when I ball my fist up, when I shake it at God in anger, being upset with God, and I turn my Bibles to and I turn my Bible to Hebrews chapter 11. And I read about all those who did the very same thing as well. I know I am in some good company. God is okay with you being mad at him. God is okay with you being upset with him. But don't you disobey him. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than man. These men said, but if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we still would not bow down to your God nor your image. There may be some here this morning who find themselves being forged in the fire, having no idea how they're going to get out. But I want to give you some comfort this morning. You're not being handled by any old person. You're being handled by the master bladesmith himself. Yes. The God of heaven who knows your life, who knows how much you're actually able to bear. And then he'll give us the strength we need to overcome that. If you're not a child of God this morning, we invite you to be one. Again, Paul says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, being willing to believe, repent, confess, and thus being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And those of us who are Christians, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We invite you this morning to come as we sing now the song of invitation. I heard an old, old 